There is a heartbreaking loss in the front lines of this fight. A well-known ER doctor here in New York who battled to save the lives of so many others. Her family now says she has taken her own life after describing the horror she saw. I am literally telling you that they're murdering these people and nobody will listen to me. These people aren't dying from COVID. They don't care what is happening to these people. They don't. I'm literally coming here every day and watching them kill them. It's like going in the fucking twilight zone. Like everyone here is okay with this. The only way I can kind of put this into context for everybody is, and this is gonna be kind of an extreme example. This is like really the only thing I can come up with. It's like if we were in Nazi Germany and they were like taking the Jews to go put them in a gas chamber, I'm the one like there saying, hey, this is not good. This is bad. This is wrong. We should not be doing this. And then everyone tells me, hang in there. You're doing a great job. You can't These save everyone. are dying from COVID. Let me give you several examples here. Uh, an anesthesiologist um, intubated the patient's like, I think it was right bronchi and of a patient and they couldn't get the sats up. And for about five hours, like we were waiting on a chest X-ray to confirm that the placement was wrong. And in the meantime, while we're waiting for that, and we've told the anesthesiologist that it was placed wrong because like literally only one side of his fucking chest is like inflating. Um, he a dies. patient had a heart rate of 40 and the resident <laughs> starts doing chest compressions on him, which is not what you do. You just externally pace them or you give them some atropine. And then, you know, I run in there to stop him from doing chest compressions on somebody with a fucking pulse. And then he decides to push Epi. He throws some pads on them, on him to, to defibrillate the guy in bradycardia. Okay, he has a heart rate of 40 in a stable, you know, bradycardic rhythm. We just need to give him some, like some atropine and pace him. He fucking defibrillates him and kills him. And I was literally ran out of like the patient's room to get like the director of nursing who was standing out there. And I'm like, can you stop him? He's going to kill that patient. He's going to kill that patient if he defibrillates him with bradycardia and a heart rate of 40. And the director of nursing just shook his head and I turned around and he killed the dude. <sighs> there was a nurse who played, placed an NG tube into, um, into some guy's lungs and filled his lungs with tube feeding. There was a nurse who confused uh, a long-acting insulin with a short-acting acting insulin and gave 30 units of a fast-acting insulin and killed the guy. It's just here they're just going to let them rot on the vent. They're medically mismanaging these patients. And, like, I'm not a doctor, guys. I'm not professing to be a doctor by any means. But there's, like I said, basic standards of care that we have to do. When somebody's low on blood, like literally on the brink of a critical low blood level, we should replace the blood. But I asked the residents and they're like, does he have internal bleeding? And I said, no. Then they're like, well, then we're not replacing the blood. Well, here's the thing. In these COVID patients, they all eventually need a blood transfusion. What is particular about avian and pandemic viruses is that they replicate deep inside our lungs. When our cells detect this and trigger a very strong innate immune response, this leads to an influx of white blood cells and fluids into our lungs and that restricts the amount of airspace that we have to breathe. The symptoms um, are very graphic and very, very striking. So, you know, it's said that some people drowned in their own phlegm. So if it was hitting or affecting the lungs, uh, people were spurting blood from their ears and their noses. Descriptions of people turning blue um, or purple. So, you know, it was really, really severe. Their blood, like, if you don't have enough blood to actually oxygenate your body, the vent settings don't fucking matter because you have no oxygen carrying capacity of your blood. We have a nurse who fell asleep at the fucking nurse's station while we were all in rooms and her norepinephrine ran out and the guy had no fucking blood pressure and didn't perfuse his brain and now I'm pretty sure he's brain dead. That same nurse is now running a CRRT machine, a dialysis-like machine that she has never done before. She said she'll figure it out. I'm literally coming here every day and watching them kill them. We're not treating the COVID guys. For real, we're not treating the COVID. You know, every day we try and get these guys off the vents, right? Because, you know, there's criteria for weaning. Every day, the day shift nurse will wean them down to minimum sedation. 
every night we come in and we get the same two residents and they fucking max out all the sedation again and undo all the work from the day shift. And the day shift attending will come in and they'll all do rounds and they'll be like, he wasn't synchronizing with the vent. So we had to turn all the sedation on. And I'm like, he wasn't synchronizing with the vent because it's in the wrong vent mode. I even tried getting a hold like of black advocacy groups here. <laughs> they just put me on hold or hang up on me. Can someone come up with like some type of a solution for me? Because I'm kind of out of ideas. I mean, guys, they literally don't even know when they're dead. Like, how many times have I told you they've assigned me a dead person? Like, how long have they been dead? Nobody knows. Nobody. Nobody has listened to anybody's lungs as long as I've been here. Even with disposable stethoscopes. I keep telling them that, you know, the guys are, like, the, my patient's going acidotic. We need to do something about this before his kidneys shut down. You know, give him some bicarb or something like that. And this is what they do. They let the patient's blood get acidotic. Their kidneys shut down. And then at the last minute, they finally decide to run bicarb. So they run five liters of bicarb into a person who's gained 20 pounds of water weight and completely throw him into heart failure and he dies several hours later. Like guys, they're not dying of COVID. I am literally telling you that they're murdering these people and nobody will listen to me. I mean, like I said, I'm not a doctor, but I'm pretty sure that when you defibrillate somebody with a heartbeat of 40 in a stable rhythm and you kill them, that's murder. And I'm pretty sure that when you put somebody's peep up to like 25 and peep doesn't go past, I think like 15, 20, and you, you blow their lungs out and they die, I'm pretty sure that's murder. All right, guys, I'm going to the unit. Let's see how they kill them there, okay? Stay safe. Stay out of NYC for your health care. We get more now from NBC's Stephanie Gosk. Today, a tragedy of a different magnitude among the ranks of health workers who have treated the sickest of the sick. Dr. Lorna Breen, an emergency room doctor at New York's Presbyterian Hospital, took her own life. In a statement to NBC News, her father said, like the many heroes that are still there, she was in every way in the trenches of this war, fighting the effects of this COVID virus that she contracted herself. Dr. Breen survived the virus, but it was the grueling work, her father says, that took a grave toll. Life and death struggles are part of the job at any hospital. But for many health workers, the coronavirus experience has been more difficult and more emotional. 